Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Yingxia. I'm an assistant professor at HKU Faculty of Law. I'll be hosting today's uh, book talk at the CCPL. So today we are very honored to have Professor Ryan Mitchell with us to discuss his new book entitled Recentering the World, China and the Transformation of International Law. Ryan is a colleague at CUHK Faculty of Law. Uh, he holds a DJD from Harvard Law School and a PhD in law from Yale University. Ryan's research focuses on international law, legal history and theory, and Chinese law. His scholarship has appeared in leading academic journals, including the Harvard International Law Journal and the Harvard Human Rights Journal. In his current research, Ryan situates the origins of modern doctrines of sovereignty in the context of late 19th to early 20th century globalization and examines systemic implications of China's increasingly active role in public international law. So without further ado, I will now pass the floor to Ryan. Great. So uh, thank you so much, Ying, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, really looking forward to being able to share uh, a little bit of this project with everyone um, and to summarize some of the main uh, findings that went into this book project. So I'm just going to bring up uh, my PowerPoint here to play that. Uh, okay. So, yeah, basically this book is uh, intended to serve as a overview, more or less, of China's role in the modern international law system, uh, starting from the process of integration in the uh, 1840s and 50s. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when people talk about this subject, uh, and there's been an increasing amount of attention to this as China's role in the international order and international legal order has become more and more important in recent years, but generally uh, in works that do look at this kind of long narrative of China's integration into international law and international legal order, people tend to start with the first opium war, um, which is a very dramatic and important event, and it's one in which there's really quite a lot of uh, uh, attention that's been paid to the sort of different understandings of law and sovereignty and justifications for military action and all that that happened in the First Opium War. But um, I, I was actually not interested primarily in that first moment of conflict, but instead in kind of looking more granularly at what came after. So the narrative of this book more or less starts in 1850, uh, when China has already found itself really ensconced in a Western dominated world order. The old system has more or less stopped functioning uh, and there is a search for new approaches to doing things, to asserting Chinese power and status in the world and also to finding a model for relations with the West and also with China's neighbors and its traditional uh, tributary states, etc., and even with its own internal coalitions of different ethnicities and peoples. Uh, and basically, there is not a answer to how those relationships should be managed for many, many decades. Uh, but the process of trying to determine these new approaches, to decide how much of the old imperial way of thinking about law and interstate relations should be kept, and how much should be abandoned, how many of the new Western international legal ideas should be adopted, uh, that sort of process is something that I really wanted to focus on, and also to focus on the way that that very directly interfaced with China's uh, and Chinese officials and diplomats and lawyers' actual participation in various different settings. So uh, it was really looking at these kind of interwoven processes uh, on a more uh, granular level in more detail, and also uh, with a very archival approach, uh, looking at especially at diplomatic archives of various different states. Uh, including Chinese diplomatic archives across different regimes, 
as well as uh, Japanese diplomatic archives, which uh, provided some very useful pieces of information, uh, those of Western states, of course, as well, and some international organizations. Uh, and really using that as kind of the foundational layer in terms of the actual research to try and figure out uh, exactly how this these processes occurred of engagement and reception of ideas, and then eventually of influencing global legal ideas. And then also uh, to sort of develop this longer narrative uh, about the directionality of that pro of that overall process, the way that Chinese initiatives in international law were formed over time, and the actual impacts that they had. Uh, so it basically going throughout this whole process of developing the narrative, uh, I found myself not necessarily trying to uh, overthrow any of the existing accounts of these processes. So this is not intended as a kind of radically revisionist uh, history of China and international legal order. It uh, does build on some of the really excellent scholarship that's already been done uh, by figures such as Emmanuel Xu, uh, Runa Svarvarud uh, more recently, uh, and the other figures that I've listed here, along with plenty of others, who have talked about uh, different aspects of this longer uh, narrative and of this process. Uh, and generally speaking, I found that I was not, uh, you know, finding major contradictions to these existing narratives. However, I did find that uh, in a lot of cases, there were some aspects that uh, were dealt with by one of these previous, uh, you know, leading accounts that were not dealt with by others. And so it could be important to juxtapose those findings together and do some comparing and contrasting see what was perhaps missed in some accounts that was noticed in others. Uh, and then also I found that there were some contextual factors that were uh, overall underemphasized in the existing scholarship that did, I think, deserve increasing emphasis. So I'll be getting to those uh, in just a second. Uh, but generally speaking, what I was trying to do here was to uh, look at a few different aspects of this longer narrative that I think are particularly important and also do have uh, continued bearing today on China's role in the international legal order. So uh, to summarize four of those that I think are particularly important, um, one is uh, the importance of realizing the extent to which China as a state served as an object of liberal legal projects and of forms of legislation that were being imposed by uh, Western states uh, individually, but also collectively, and via actually really innovative forms of legislation at the international level, creating multilateral, almost quasi-constitutional frameworks to govern China and its space, as well as its role in the broader region. Uh, so to the extent that this was something that was really being newly developed as a practice in international law during the very period that China was entering into the international legal system, China was uh, almost the sort of test case or guinea pig for a lot of these uh, significant developments. So I wanted to focus on that aspect of things uh, in particular, uh, which I think was quite important as well in framing some of the uh, motives for China's own uh, projects in international law, as well as the subsequent discourse uh, on international legal topics within China. Uh, I also clearly, uh, relatedly as a part of that, wanted to look at the second point that's listed here, which is this uh, important theme of how the concept of sovereignty and other related legal concepts uh, came to China and what that process looked like. Uh, and that was uh, something that I found was really a sort of process of a reception of an interwoven net of different concepts, including sovereignty, but also uh, issues relating to property, uh, interstate obligations, debt uh, and finance, uh, policy autonomy, uh, issues relating to 
the legal status of different populations and concepts such as self-determination, uh, et cetera. So uh, I wanted to look at this sort of process of conceptual reception uh, occurring within China of these international legal concepts with a particular focus on sovereignty. Um, and I will, in again, in just a second, get to the, more of the details of uh, what I found with regards to uh, that process. Um, I also looked at uh, the active engagement of Chinese officials with international law settings uh, in meetings and uh, uh, codification uh, exchanges and uh, debates, especially. Uh, and then I also looked at this broader uh, theme of the lasting impact or influence of China and Chinese diplomats and lawyers and officials in international law. Uh, and I reached some, uh, I think, relatively modest conclusions about that impact. Uh, so I'm not claiming that uh, China was the real, you know, uh, uh, patriarch of the current international legal system. And uh, that would be certainly uh, a much too uh, extreme claim. But uh, I did find that there were some significant forms of influence that have been very much underemphasized and that have not really been adequately taken into account. Uh, I think both in terms of the historical scholarship and also more so uh, and particularly uh, perniciously in the international legal world itself. So in the, in, in the international law profession, there is very, uh, despite a, a recent turn to history in international law, there's a very limited awareness of um, China's role specifically, but also of non-Western influences more generally uh, into the development of modern international legal norms. So uh, I'm hoping that this book will serve to sort of correct a little bit of that uh, lack of attention that has been the case so far uh, and will serve to kind of uh, add another dimension to this ongoing turn to history and international law uh, as it's been called. So going point by point, uh, I just want to start with legal objectification. Uh, this, I think, is a, certainly an important aspect of uh, understanding the role of international law in modern Chinese history and China's process of uh, joining the modern international legal order. Um, so the person I put up on screen is uh, W.A.P. Martin, uh, and he is uh, often considered to be the man who brought international law to China, in a sense. Uh, so he was a Western missionary who was uh, involved in leading the project for the first translation of an international legal text into Chinese, uh, the Wan Guo Gong Fa, uh, which was based on Henry Wheaton's uh, Elements of International Law, a uh, leading uh, textbook by an American diplomat of the mid-19th century. Uh, and so this is uh, Martin, uh, the, the, a copy of the 1864 translation uh, that Martin spearheaded with assistance from some Qing officials, uh, and also uh, an image of Martin in 1900 uh, at the time of the Boxer uprising, which he was uh, fleeing and actually actively uh, resisting in Beijing with that rifle that he's carrying. Uh, and uh, some of his comments at the time uh, of the Boxer Uprising really underscore the extent to which he was not uh, this sort of pure and simple kind of, you know, uh, advocate for the cause of China among the states of the world. He was really very interested in transforming China, liberalizing China, and turning it into a regime that would be uh, a better fit, as he saw it, in the, inter in the Western dominated international legal system. So uh, in my account, I really tried to focus on some personalities such as Martin and to uh, explore these aspects of their thinking that have perhaps not really been fully adequately dealt with in some of the existing conversations. Um, and so we see Martin, for instance, uh, describing his own background, uh, before he decided on China as a place to go for his missionary career. Uh, he says, you know, when he was uh, a child, his first interest in China was awakened by the First Opium War and the boom of British cannon battering down her outer walls, uh, which sounds like it could be sort of an ambiguous statement. But later on in life, including uh, at the time of the Boxer Uprising, 
he really states that he thought that the British were fully justified in launching the first opium war and in ending China's uh, isolation, as so-called, uh, and imposing Western international legal norms because those were just uh, and proper norms that uh, should have been applied. So including state relations on the basis of total equality, uh, free trade principles, uh, freedom of navigation principles, etc. These are all sort of, uh, in his view, necessary li liberal uh, norms that have to be extended to every corner of the globe. And in that sense, he's typical of international legal thinkers of the mid-19th century in the West. Uh, so a little bit later on, after he's arrived in China and serving as a, a missionary as well as a consultant to various diplomats, Martin uh, is really a strong advocate of the United States interfering in the Taiping Rebellion, stepping in and supporting a Han Chinese uh, separatist state against the Manchu leadership. And his justification for doing so, uh, which I quote, is... Uh, looking at the United States and its expansion into the West uh, as an analog, he says, it was not the waters of the Rio Grande River that divided Texas from Mexico, but the impossibility of Anglo-American Protestants being one with Spanish Catholics. So this very uh, racialized notion of uh, cultural civilizational progress is one that he is really, uh, again, it's not, he's not a kind of idiosyncratic guy in this respect. It's very typical uh, of the time. And it is applied by him and other international legal thinkers, including uh, Johann Kasper Blunchley and other leading uh, theorists in Europe. Uh, it's being applied to China very much so at this time with the idea that there is a progressive element in China that the West can step in and support while uh, taking punitive, punishing actions against the conservative element in China and using international law. And it's very loose at the time, doctrines relating to the use of force in particular uh, as a way to carry out that punishment of the bad element and promotion of the progressive element in Chinese society. And, and of course, this carries not just racial and cultural civilizational aspects, but also very much uh, spatial uh, and geographical aspects as well. So Martin is another big advocate of dominating China's internal waters and the idea that Western uh, gunboats need to be free to roam the entirety uh, of the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers and their various tributaries uh, and really exert that dominant force uh, in inland China as well as on the coasts. And international law is a rule set that especially at the time, and especially based on the innovations being made at the time, really is useful for promoting those goals. So uh, ultimately, uh, although I do try to fairly credit Martin with his contributions to China's reception of Western uh, international law and other areas of knowledge, uh, I also try to bring this aspect of things uh, a little bit more into the spotlight. Uh, and also to sort of see him as typical for uh, a kind of broader type uh, in the history of Western engagements with China, which is this sort of uh, celebrity missionary kind of figure who's a very entrepreneurial go-getter who has a kind of deep interest in China, but also is very consciously simultaneously using that to uh, advance their own career, both while they're in China and also back in the West. Uh, doing a lot of networking, in Martin's case, with the leading international lawyers in Europe, uh, and then using his connections in Europe to then further develop his ties uh, with the Qing bureaucracy back and forth. So uh, this kind of uh, very self-made man, kind of uh, rather self-interested sort of figure, uh, I think is really actually quite typical of a lot of the international law consultants and specialists, and even pacifists and activists from the West that I talk about in the book that uh, had various dealings with China. So uh, in terms of the reception of Western ideas of law and sovereignty, uh, I found that uh, there were some aspects that deserved some increasing emphasis during the period that's covered in the narrative of the book. Uh, and I especially wanted to focus on two aspects that I thought had not been fully uh, adequately dealt with uh, 
in existing work, uh, especially on the earlier period that's dealt with in the book, sort of the first half of the book. And one of those is uh, Qing officials and scholars and their views, which often actually got pretty close to Western notions of equal state sovereignty well in advance of uh, the period when we usually think that they had adopted such views. So although they were not necessarily totally adopting the language of Western international law, actually Qing officials as early as the late 1850s during uh, tariff negotiations and other such encounters were really operating on the basis of uh, ideas uh, of uh, equal uh, binding treaty relations on a contractual basis, pacta sunt servanda type ideas, as well as the notion that uh, various types of policy autonomy could be uh, considered so central to the state's power or its identity that they should not be given up in one of those treaties. Uh, and then I found in terms of the reception of the concept of sovereignty or juquan itself, uh, the Japanese influence really, uh, I think, though, though it certainly has not been ignored in existing work, really deserves perhaps even more emphasis than it has gotten uh, up to this point. So uh, Okubo Toshimichi in particular, who was this sort of uh, minister for home affairs of the Meiji uh, during their early years, uh, I found was uh, extremely significant uh, throughout the 1870s. And in particular, his spearheading of the Japanese attempt to exert sovereignty over Taiwan uh, resulted in this 1874 uh, memorandum that goes to the Qing court that really has a full list of international law authorities, a full list of key terms translated into Chinese that's actually much more clear and much more direct and uh, significant in that respect than Martin's Wang Guo Gongfa translation. Uh, and it's really thrust in front of the eyes of Qing officials uh, with the backing of Japan's modernizing military, uh, you know, right, right adjacent to it. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, I found that both via that sort of diplomatic uh, dispute and encounter, as well as via uh, the uh, Japanese intellectual reception of these ideas with lots of translations being made into Japanese and into and then into Chinese sort of uh, in a rather fluid way back and forth between the two languages, uh, uh, especially for particular terms, which could just be identical, obviously, um, that the, the really the Japanese influence with the reception of many of these concepts uh, deserves increasing emphasis. So uh, just on the uh, on the point of Juchuan itself as a term, uh, I found that uh, uh, probably we should credit that uh, to a mixed influence of ancient Chinese thought plus the Japanese uh, uh, model and example uh, in the 1870s. Uh, and in particular, the fact that um, the Western missionary translators such as uh, Martin and kind of his predecessors slash role model, a German Lutheran missionary named Karl Gutzlaff, really did not want to emphasize uh, Juquan per se. They wanted to emphasize this concept of Zizhu Juquan or right of self-rule, right of autonomy, which was connected with a sort of liberal idea of uh, self-determination by specific ethnic groups in nation states and not the idea of a kind of uh, purely legalistic conception of territorial sovereignty that could be attributed to the Qing state just as easily as it could be to uh, a Han Chinese ethno state. So uh, Zhu Quan also, and this is a point that I really try to emphasize whenever I mention the subject, is an existing Chinese word. So we see it uh, in ancient texts as well, such as uh, in the Guanzi, where we read uh, uh, when the treasury is depleted, a ruler's authority wanes. Uh, and various other references to Juquan, uh, which obviously does not have the, the 19th or 20th century legal meanings of the term as it was then uh, imbued with, but uh, it is used to refer to a specific type of power attributed to a ruler. And the existing term was then given additional content via the process of receiving international law ideas, uh, including uh, via Martin's translation, but also, as, as I just said, I think more so 
via the influence of uh, the Japanese insistence on the concept of Juchen that they were unfolding in these diplomatic encounters, and then also via the uh, international law authorities that were being favored by Japan. So in particular, Blunchley's work and other continental European works uh, uh, on territorial sovereignty were uh, soon after the Sino-Japanese conflicts uh, and disputes were then immediate, very quickly translated into Chinese. And there you find the use of terms like Juchen used quite a bit more than you did in, uh, in Martin's translation. So, okay, uh, this is, I'm just using Duchen here as an example of uh, the con conceptual reception of a very significant term, but of course there were a lot of others relating to concepts uh, such as, as I mentioned, debt, such as uh, interstate obligation, uh, as well as concepts such as changed circumstances, whereby uh, a treaty obligation could potentially be uh, annulled based on uh, a change in the circumstances of uh, of the states involved. So uh, basically, these are these sorts of issues that already by the late Qing period, officials and scholars are putting a lot of emphasis on. And this is especially uh, apparent with diplomats and in some of their encounters with their Western counterparts, as well as with their writings uh, to their superiors back home. Uh, and the concept of ranking and hierarchy is also especially important uh, for the Chinese diplomats and officials uh, in Beijing. And this becomes sort of a, a real obsession. Uh, and it's one that's uh, that kind of complicates the, many of the narratives of China's reception of international law. Uh, because uh, although coming from a sort of subaltern position, a very oppressed sort of status, as, as, I, as has been said, an object, of international legal regulation, there's nonetheless always this aspiration for great power status, uh, for being one of the great powers alongside the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, uh, and then Japan. And uh, that really never goes away throughout the entire period covered by the book. Uh, it's never a purely egalitarian sort of third world, uh, you know, kind of uh, initiative that's coming from the Chinese side. Although you do see those elements in the, the views of some particular individuals uh, and commentators. So um, just on that 1874 memorandum from Okubo uh, to the Qing officials, uh, this is just uh, a brief expert excerpt that has um, some of those details. So in particular, the line from Vattel, the law of nations will not recognize property or sovereignty of a nation except over empty lands, where it has effectively and genuinely occupied them or formed them uh, formed in them an establishment or of which it will make actual use. And the Japanese side is kind of thrusting this in front of the Qing side. Uh, and they're using Vattel's property and sovereignty uh, combined into just the term Juchen. So clearly by now we're very far away from the old uh, notion of Juchen in China, which was attached to the power of a ruler, a personalistic uh, and pretty feudal conception of sovereign power. So uh, in addition, I, I looked at uh, active engagement of Chinese officials and diplomats in international legal settings. So um, in settings such as the one depicted here, where we see the Qing uh, delegates to the first Hague conference, as well as the family of the lead delegate, Yang Ru. Uh, so that's uh, his his wife. He, so he was actually Han Chinese. His wife is Manchu, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, and uh, and their children here. Uh, but here they are uh, in The Hague, uh, attending the first Hague conference. Uh, and I found that across uh, the forms of engagement that I looked at uh, in the book, um, you know, across a lot of these sort of major meetings uh, and uh, and other such settings, there was a kind of generally consistent set of preoccupations, uh, including those I just mentioned, uh, territorial uh, sovereignty and uh, sanctity against incursions of foreign, foreign uses of force, uh, as well as uh, issues of uh, ranking and hierarchy in particular. And China's uh, eventually, only gradually over time, uh, did these also include a strong bias in favor of uh, international dispute resolution, 
via uh, the uh, PCA, uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration, and then later via international courts. Uh, and then um, also China's own pretensions to be a leading power in terms of global governance uh, became an increasingly important theme. So uh, what we saw basically uh, across uh, the various conferences and other settings that are looked at in the book is the development of these agendas, uh, which are really quite consistent across different regimes. Uh, there's really very little actually uh, ideological difference between uh, the even the late Qing uh, diplomats and officials that were interested in or working with international law and those of the Republic of China era, of the warlord era, the Republic era uh, under Jiang, or uh, or of the PRC even. Uh, although by the time of the PRC, uh, some aspects relating to global governance in particular do become quite distinct in terms of the actual institutions that they're interested in promoting. Uh, but generally speaking, we see throughout that process uh, the formation of various types of impact uh, that I tried to give a just uh, account of that would not be either under or overemphasizing the, these forms of impact. Um, and so again, I, I decided to really try to focus on individuals. Um, so in particular, we have figures uh, such as Wang Chonghui, who was uh, one of the leading international lawyers of the early 20th century, uh, was a, um, uh, served as a diplomat, but also as a uh, Supreme Court uh, justice in China, and also as a, China's first international judge, uh, and was very heavily involved in a lot of legal and diplomatic contexts. Um, so he eventually becomes China's uh, one of China's leading representatives in the League of Nations, uh, and uh, he's involved there in some of the uh, League of Nations uh, efforts for the formation of new judicial norms and the development of the Permanent Court uh, of International Justice, uh, which he serves as a judge on, and then also in the planning for the International Court of Justice uh, in 1945, uh, along with uh, other aspects of the UN San Francisco conference. So Wang uh, actually emerges as one of the strongest advocates of uh, international compulsory dispute resolution via the International Court of Justice during the meetings of 1945. And in fact, he's the one who proposes, uh, he proposes a motion to make uh, going to the ICJ compulsory for interstate disputes on a universal level for all states that are part of the UN. Uh, and he gets a lot of support from third world states uh, and from uh, some others, some European states, but uh, this is uh, something that is uh, shot down uh, significantly by both the Soviet Union and the United States, and more directly by the United States uh, in particular, during the actual meetings, um, U.S. representatives actually point to the recent death of uh, President Roosevelt and use that as a reason why everyone should just sort of uh, forego trying to be too disruptive during the course of the uh, the San Francisco conference and introducing two radical new ideas. Uh, such as uh, compulsory uh, jurisdiction of the ICJ over interstate disputes. So these sorts of uh, encounters, I think, are uh, quite significant and do deserve to be um, remembered and uh, perhaps to be further explored as well uh, in, in terms of some of the other dimensions that could not fit into, you know, uh, into a, a single book, uh, looking at, the, at, you know, quite a few uh, different episodes. So I, see, I think certainly there's a lot of uh, additional details there to be discovered. Um, but I tried to give an account basically of uh, whenever I looked at these diplomatic encounters of the individuals involved, uh, of their views, of their interactions, uh, and of the relationship of those interactions with both uh, the national government's positions in Beijing or Nanjing, as well as of uh, the popular uh, sentiment surrounding international law and sovereignty issues, uh, which of course was another major factor. 
So uh, one of the other big themes that we see is the kind of popularization of international law and sovereignty ideas where people throughout Chinese society and, of course, also uh, activists and uh, political groups start to really adopt the language of sovereignty as well as of uh, unequal treaties, of uh, autonomy, policy autonomy, tariff autonomy, the ability of a state to set its own uh, uh, macroeconomic policy, which is really quite fundamental, obviously, as we see in the world today, it's becoming increasingly fundamental. This is something that was specifically denied to uh, the Qing uh, and then to their successor states via those initial treaties, uh, especially after the Second Opium War, uh, more so than the first. And uh, the attempt to regain uh, that sort of policy autonomy becomes a really, again, universally across movements within China, from the far left to the far right and in between, becomes something that more or less everybody agrees on. Uh, with the one exception, uh, perhaps, uh, of uh, collaborators with Japan, who I will have a chance to very briefly discuss uh, right now. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of the more mainstream figures, uh, I think uh, really not just for the sake of China's uh, international law history and the history of its engagement with international law, but general international legal history, uh, they actually played quite an important role. So figures such as Wang Chonghui um, or uh, Liang Yunli, who was a uh, Shanghai judge who eventually became uh, a very significant diplomat and also uh, for almost two decades was uh, the UN uh, as a Republic of China representative at the UN was uh, the UN Secretariat's uh, liaison official with the uh, International Law Commission and was really one of the strongest and most consistent proponents of codification throughout the whole early Cold War period. Um, so he... Um, rather unaccountably, I, I thought, has been almost totally forgotten and unmentioned in international law scholarship, more or less, uh, since he died. Uh, so for a few figures like that, I really wanted to just sort of try to bring them back into the conversation to some extent. Uh, so uh, yeah, the question of China and uh, state equality and hegemony, I think, is one that I will probably close on. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we really, although we see very strong emphasis on uh, interstate equality uh, and sovereignty of even weak states uh, coming from Chinese diplomats and lawyers and officials uh, throughout the whole period covered by the book, uh, as I mentioned, this is very much coupled with this aspiration for great power status, which we see in settings such as the Hague conferences already where uh, the Chinese diplomats are making some arguments that are in favor of uh, all weak states, but really much more so are, are making claims based on China's size and importance uh, and economic uh, and military potential that it should be considered a great power alongside those of the West. Uh, and not making the same arguments for, you know, El Salvador. Uh, so uh, this varies between the different officials that are being dis that are discussed in the book, but uh, it is more or less a consistent uh, aspect. Uh, and of course, with the advent of the Cold War, this also becomes a major factor as uh, the Republic of China uh, in Taiwan uh, sort of is uh, laying claim to a kind of uh, to its seat on the UN Security Council. Uh, as well as its status uh, as a leading power, uh, very much closely tied with the United States uh, Cold War uh, agenda of you know, not recognizing uh, Beijing. And of course, uh, in terms of Beijing's own agenda during the early Cold War, uh, this is involved with uh, trying to maintain control over these uh, inherited Qing territories from Xinjiang to uh, Tibet, of course, uh, and uh, increase, and also with regards to Taiwan uh, and other territorial disputes. Um, 
And, uh, and also in terms of the claim to be uh, the Sino-Soviet split and the claim to be a leader of the third world. So, of course, to claim to be a leader uh, ideologically and in terms of initiating projects uh, is distinct from being a totally uh, homogenous member of that group. And we see that with regards even to the Bandung uh, conference and to uh, some of the related initiatives that Chinese officials under uh, both uh, under actually, uh, so the uh, the the uh, Liu Xiaoqi aligned officials and Mao uh, during the Cultural Revolution and Deng uh, and his followers afterwards, all do not really want to fully embrace third world uh, agendas that do not originate in Beijing itself. Um, Okay, so I'll just close uh, with some of what I think are kind of the more minor or subsidiary contributions, one of which uh, I just alluded to, which is looking at a few figures that have been forgotten, uh, actually probably on the basis of uh, deliberate um, damnatio memoriae or deliberate, you know, being condemned to be forgotten. Uh, so figures such as uh, Zhou Wei, who was a very significant early Chinese international lawyer, the first actual member of the Institut de Droit International, uh, from China, um, the leading international law association founded uh, in 1873, uh, and also uh, author of a major treatise outlining, outlining an international legal organization before the founding of the League of Nations. And he was actually, along with Wellington Koo, one of the Chinese members of the panel for the creation of the League of Nations. Um, he was involved in those and a lot of other significant uh, events uh, that transpired. However, he later collaborated with Japan uh, in the mid-30s, along with a couple other international lawyers that are mentioned in the book. And uh, as a result, uh, was, of course, became persona non grata after the war uh, for both of the dueling sides of the ROC and PRC, and uh, eventually... Uh, ended up uh, attempting suicide while he was being prosecuted as a war criminal uh, and uh, was not successful, but did die a few years later in 1949. Uh, uh, and uh, a few of these other sort of tragic figures, uh, I think, are significant, not just as kind of interesting, you know, stories, but actually to provide a larger, uh, more comprehensive sense of some of the influences that were exerted by Chinese figures. Uh, during this uh, very complicated and messy early 20th century period of transformation of international law. Uh, so some events that I think were especially important uh, that also deserve more attention today include the Washington Naval Conference, which really uh, more so than Versailles acted as really a kind of uh, multilateral constitutional type uh, treaty arrangement for China. Uh, and the Hague Codification Conference, where uh, Chinese diplomats and international lawyers came in with very strong um, hopes to try and convince uh, other states, and Western states in particular, uh, of the importance of uh, adopting a more hands-off approach to their management of China and their use of those, uh, those treaty rights inherited from the Qing era. Um, and then also uh, with regards to uh, especially significant periods such as uh, the 1940s where we have uh, through early 50s where we have in succession San Francisco conference, Bretton Woods, Bandung uh, and other conferences um, such as uh, the Geneva conference, which really acts to wrap up the Korean war uh, and initiates a new phase in the Vietnam war. Um, there is a lot there, uh, really far too much for me to be able to uh, deal with it in this particular book. Uh, so I just tried to kind of convey some of the main themes that were typical of those particular uh, events and encounters, and really to try and perhaps set the stage for future work to look in more detail uh, at these kind of uh, periods uh, in a more contextualized way. So that uh, I think more or less covers the main uh, overall uh, findings and kind of aims of the book. And uh, generally speaking, uh, I am uh, hopeful to kind of be able to follow up on some of those points that uh, I mentioned towards the end uh, and uh, really welcome 
anyone's questions. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for listening and uh, looking forward to uh, providing any additional information that uh, that might be of interest. Thank you, Ryan. This is very interesting. And uh, it's a very rich and solid research on China's um, contemporary history and its interaction with the modern international legal system. It's also very timely and very valuable addition to uh, the study of, and as Ryan himself has mentioned, non-Western influences on international legal order. So congratulations again on completing such a um, wonderful project. So I, it, although I also have some questions of my own, but I know that there are already some questions raised by the audience. And I think our colleagues uh, that work on legal history and international law may also have some comments to share. So if I uh, could just open the floor to our audience now and see and if anyone wants to, and from, our, um, from our faculty, have any questions, comments to, to start with. Hi, hi Ryan. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Ying. Uh, 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 this is, um, I think, a, a really important work in the field. And so I had a couple of questions uh, for Ryan uh, about the, the project that uh, I think he uh, touched on quite a bit in his presentation. Um, the first is, you know, the book does a, a great job of, of situating uh, the sort of concept of self-knowledge, as you put it, right? Uh, situating the discourse locally, uh, how these different uh, concepts were indigenized, and especially, you know, I, I like the regional aspect of, of bringing in Japan and the other uh, non-Western actors. Um, so one question I had was about uh, sort of the actors that do appear in the book. Uh, and you mentioned, I think at one point, that there is this sort of like elite nucleus of actors who sort of go across all of these very different regimes, right? And so one of the thoughts that I, I've always had in looking at this the sort of cast of characters is, is there something about the homogeneity of their social or religious backgrounds that sort of brings them together in this way, right? That they could become elite, right? Not everyone can go to Harvard, right? During this period of time and have access to these types of, of, of networks. Um, and the other thing on the, on the sort of the national scale is how much the US appeared in the early part of the book, right? Uh, and even though this is, uh, something that uh, I've looked at myself, most of these histories, right, ground the European voice. Europe is actually pretty small in the early part of the book. There's a lot of like the U.S. and people consider the U.S. to be a, a marginal actor during some of these eras. So I was sort of interested in, in that choice. The second sort of like bigger question is this way of framing the sort of recapturing contribution, right? I think uh, you cite a lot of critical and especially explicitly Marxist scholars, right, whose view of international law is simply as an epiphenomenal power play, right? Uh, and if I was taking their position, I look at all of these wonderful, like you, you have a lot of praise for like Wellington Koo in, in particular, right? You show that these are incredibly intelligent, competent people who make persuasive arguments and it fails every time, right? At the Second Hague Conference, at Versailles, uh, and no matter what they're able to do, Right? The fact is that they're enmeshed in this power system and their arguments don't resonate. That would seem to be what the critical position would say, right? So why sort of recapture from the critical position they're sort of participating in this thing that they can't possibly, uh, possibly win? And then the last thing then is, this is such an interesting book in working at the intersections of international legal history, right? And the history of international law. And so I wondered if you, you talk about going back in, to some of these episodes, I'm wondering, do you really see this as in the future of making an intervention in the present? Like chapter nine covers a lot of territory, right? And getting this up to the present. Is that a conversation you want to keep having? Or do you see yourself as doing more traditional like legal history of contextualizing these individual times or bringing this into sort of the present? Um, so those are just a, a few of my sort of like a, a initial reactions from uh, what's a really uh, quite significant book. Great. Well, well, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Jed, for uh, that set of questions, which I think was uh, really very incisive. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, I mean, I could probably spend, uh, you know, a few months thinking of, of really strong answers to each of those, uh, uh, more so than I, than I can really 
generate at the moment, but um, because I think you really pointed to to quite significant aspects uh, of the overall argument um, that are deserving of of more consideration. Um, so, with regards to the uh, role of the United States, I think in particular, uh, looking at that, you know, I think that's that's a very good point. So, certainly looking back um, via you know perhaps a, a very presentist bias, we look back and we kind of want to understand how the Sino-U.S. relationship that is so, you know, uh, significant in terms of the contours of our present day world, uh, where it came from and how that relationship uh, evolved over time. Uh, but that is by itself is certainly not the theme of the book. Um, uh, and definitely the European powers and Britain in particular played a larger role uh, in terms of the actual power politics on the ground during the uh, the entirety of the 19th century. Uh, I think uh, one of the reasons why the U.S. had a kind of special role during that period, though, uh, one is that the uh, U.S. Um, does have a unique status in that it is adopting these more indirect forms of influence. So it is not using the gunboat card to try and uh, procure concessions directly. It's really relying on Britain and other states to do that first, and then it's benefiting from the MFN status. Um, but then also we very, you know, towards the end of the uh, of the 19th century, we get that state, that idea of the uh, open door policy and the United States as the protector of an open and liberal China. And that really kind of crystallizes a lot of those early, you know, motives and initiatives of people like Martin and uh, and other international lawyers in the West who wanted to adopt a kind of not purely imperialist position where they're just extracting, you know, this concession and then the next concession, but are saying that on certain terms of uh, socialization, China can become an accepted member of the Western family of nations. So I feel like the United States actually ends up representing that international law, uh, that uh, kind of position that's being taken by the international law community more so than the European states do, where a, a good amount of uh, their policy ends up continuing to be really quite traditional um, geopolitics, you know, up through really Versailles. Um, so the U.S., uh, I think, was significant, not necessarily if we're thinking in terms of purely, you know, who who had the most uh, cannons uh, aimed at uh, Chinese ports, but in terms of, uh, or even who was having the most meetings with uh, officials in Beijing, but who was uh, the best representative of the uh, international law side of the equation in terms of China's, what China could aspire to. Uh, as being a part of this system. And so we see with regards to the Hague conferences uh, and then shortly afterwards, we're already kind of getting this ventriloquizing sort of relationship where the Chinese side will appoint American officials that are consultants, but then they're really kind of making their own arguments for American principles and norms uh, in the name of China. Uh, such as for freedom of navigation and free trade uh, in particular. So I felt like that relationship was uh, really sort of central to the overall uh, narrative. And then, of course, it becomes even more important as we get to the uh, to the San Francisco conference and the U.S. basically acting as the sponsor for China to become one of the P5. Uh, and then also uh, with the related initiatives that are going on simultaneously, such as setting up the whole Bretton Woods system, et cetera, where the Chinese are kind of in this position of being forced to cooperate with the U.S. and exert very, very limited kind of pushback whenever the U.S. has firmly taken a position. So I felt like that kind of really shaped a lot of, uh, a lot of what transpired. Um, in terms of the elite nucleus of figures that's involved here and to the extent to which they're really typical or are they this kind of very strange group of, you know, people who have uh, spent, you know, maybe as much as uh, 
you know, a third or third or even half of their lives in, you know, hanging out, ha hanging around in the Ivy League uh, rather than back home in China. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it is true that uh, there cannot be this very direct sort of correlation between um, many of these elite figures and kind of the general, you know, popular movements. So, for example, people such as Wang Chonghui and Wellington Ku, they do develop very kind of technical, legal, uh, quite uh, intricate ways of arguing in, for principles of sovereignty and state uh, policy autonomy, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, what's probably more effective on the ground is the popular action strikes, uh, uh, protests, uh, insurgency uh, of the Communist Party, et cetera, uh, and of the Kuomintang uh, before it takes over. And uh, that side of things is really based on these very kind of much broader doctrines relating to state sovereignty, which are really not, they are informed by the international law doctrine, but obviously there's a disconnect, um, just like there is today with popular discourse on sovereignty, where nobody really necessarily cares, uh, you know, what exactly happens at the 60,000 foot level? Is it still national airspace or is this now you know outer space or like can can anyone freely fly through it or people just have a kind of visceral reaction based on the idea that this that is our national sovereign territory uh and its appendages so i think that that was very true in the chinese case uh as well uh, and even interestingly, so into the, the PRC period, you know, uh, you find the, the rhetoric becoming more based on this kind of populist understanding of sovereignty. But in terms of actual interactions, the PRC diplomats continue to be really kind of very much more technically minded and not interested in um, ignoring the niceties of international law whenever they're assured a seat at the table. So that's at Bandung, at Geneva, uh, and then in uh, in a lot of other kind of more minor encounters. Uh, yeah, the the whether the whole system is bunk uh, and part of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, system of power relations that you really can't do anything about in terms of just, you know, discourse. Uh, I think that's an important point to take account of. Um, I wasn't really, uh, I don't know, to a certain extent, uh, I think it's quite hard to um, draw lessons for action out of a historical account like this, um, especially one that covers a, a, enough span of chronology uh, and different topics. Um, but I am sort of uh, more or less aligned, I guess, with this kind of David Kennedy-ish view of the international law sphere as one of struggle and of, uh, you know, rhetorical and discourse types of power and influence being aligned with, but not identical with, uh, you know, with, with arms and economic power. So although they're very, very closely linked, I think we do see that there are examples where sometimes the the rhetoric uh, or the discourse adopts something like an autonomous sort of uh, role. So it, we can at least see, for example, um, the uh, some of the forms of solidarity that are developed. Uh, so with Bandung as a good example, you know, these are states that are actually exerting a type of power and agency by finding uh, a rhetoric that they can agree on in terms of describing their sovereignty and their their self-determination and so it doesn't you know really fully revolutionize the system but it does sort of uh you know at least serve as a foundation for marginal improvements i don't know if i can be too much more optimistic than that but uh but I don't want to be totally uh, uh, nihilistic about international law, uh, because I, I think that overall we do see that you know it 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 serves as it does have something of a constraining role, although it's very very highly instrumentalized, and it also has opportunities for reform. 
uh, and and different projects coming up from below. Uh, so going going into the future, I think I will be looking at uh, some of these episodes in more detail, uh, but then also uh, probably returning to a bit more uh, kind of current uh, uh, international law topics as well uh, with a kind of historicized approach. But so some of these current disputes um, over uh, law of the sea issues, over things such as uh, development and security, et cetera. Um, I think that the narrative that's presented in this book uh, can help to contextualize some aspects of what's happening now with regards to uh, Xi's uh, kind of big ticket sort of projects like the Belt and Road and uh, and the security stuff that's coming along. But uh, I'm not really, I don't want to try and make too strong an assertion that, you know, of course, if, if you were to read this book uh, and not know anything that's happened in the last 20 years, you would predict that, you know, China would launch a massive wave of infrastructure loans or something uh, like like that would be a little bit too extreme of a characterization. OK, I, I see one question in the Q&A, which is, uh, can you clarify what criteria were considered by the Chinese as territorial sovereignty? Um, I'm aware of the concept of European territorial sovereignty based on cartography. So I think that's a, that's actually also another quite good question. Um, and uh, with regards to the different conceptions of sovereignty, uh, I, I think on the Chinese side, uh, originally there was not a very strict territorial limitation, but it was very, this was a very personalistic term definitely. So Zhu Quan was literally Zhu De Quan, like Zhu is the ruler and uh, in particular the emperor, but also uh, during the Warring States period, the king or potentially the duke uh, or others. Uh, and uh, eventually by the imperial era, it's, it's very much imperial power. So the term sovereignty was really used in the context of relationships between people so it's uh, the only time when this concept of Juchen was actually used that I saw when I went back and looked through some of the more ancient stuff just to try and check to see, you know, if there was anything close uh, was, uh, was in the context of officials usurping the power of the sovereign. And then to a lesser extent, also the sovereign himself due to his own inability or whatever, not being able to exert the power of the sovereign. Uh, but uh, it was not about specific legal title to particular territories. So that aspect of sovereignty really comes in with uh, the Western international law uh, rhetoric and doctrines. And uh, one, the aspect that I wanted to focus on was that it comes in in a couple different ways. So on the one side, there is the idea that this very self-determination oriented idea that a people has a right to its own territory to be the sovereign so the chinese people have the right to be the sovereign in china uh which is uh, obviously has been very much received into modern chinese discourse today uh but of course uh when we saw that being proposed uh by these figures in the 19th century from the west they were partially interested in actually splitting up China by using that concept, uh, by saying that the Han Chinese people have a right to the traditionally Han portions of the Chinese state. And as for what happens elsewhere, well, we, we haven't decided yet, but the implication would be that, you know, there would be a lot of little protectorates set up uh, on the fringes of the Qing empire. Um, so uh, it's really actually quite remarkable that the idea of sovereignty as territorial self-determination gets fully adopted in China, but it gets associated with this idea of the Chinese people uh, as the Zhonghua Minzu, which becomes this kind of really sort of an artificially invented people or notion of a, of a popular subject that includes all of the different ethnicities and peoples uh, of China. So uh, in terms of the details of territory, 
uh, and its relationship with sovereignty. I don't think the Chinese approach is actually all that distinct from the traditional approach in the West. It's actually more the case that as of today, the Chinese view of territorial sovereignty is extremely traditional. It's really in this kind of 19th century intra-European view that you know you would expect Prussia to be articulating uh, uh, you know, in its dealings with France or Austria uh, in the 1880s. And uh, what's happened is that in the overall international legal system, sovereignty principles have been somewhat diluted uh, in terms of their relationship with global legal norms and international institutions. Uh, so uh, I, I do think in that case, in that sense, uh, the Chinese approach is uh, historically typical, but today atypical if you're comparing uh, China with other G20 states, for example. Um, so question from Michael on, uh, to what extent J Japan and Japanese and China had positive impact on Republican era China's knowledge and practice of international law? Um, uh, yeah, so the, the Japanese influence, uh, which, uh, I think was quite significant, uh, and has, has been dealt with, you know, you know, previous scholars such as Runas Farverud been really, really incisive and um, had some great, uh, great findings with regards to the Japanese influence, uh, including things like, you know, just numerical counting of translations. It's amazing that like almost all of the translations of international law texts uh, by the teens, the 19 teens were from Japanese. Uh, so there, there, there was this big influence, and it was quite lasting. Um, in terms of positive impact uh, that's still being exerted by Japan into the Republican era, uh, I think that there was actually some, uh, and so this was quite interesting. Uh, you know, the Japanese claim to hegemony over China was uh, very often articulated as this kind of Asian Monroe Doctrine idea. And like the original Monroe Doctrine, it's really, you know, it has two elements. It has the pure power politics element and the uh, use of force and intervention side of things. Uh, but then it also has this element of the rhetoric of protection, of uh, solidarity of a sort, uh, of keeping out the, you know, outside invaders and external uh, imperialists that are going to come and cause havoc in the region or exploit our people in the region. So the Japanese uh, obviously were making full use of this rhetoric um, by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and they never stopped doing so. Um, of course, generally speaking, uh, most of the figures that are dealt with in the book did not buy this narrative, and they did not see Japan as a potential protector, uh, and they saw it as, you know, for what it more or less was, which was a self-interested imperialist power representing a specific uh, elite class of, uh, you know, political and economic interests, etc., uh, but at the same time, there were those who were, you know, very much uh, willing to choose the lesser of two evils as they saw it. And so some of the lawyers in the book, such as uh, Zhou Wei, uh, as well as uh, Li Shangwu, who was another uh, early significant lawyer that ended up getting forgotten, uh, they chose to collaborate uh, in part uh, explicitly because they thought that uh, they preferred local imperialism uh, to uh, to imperialism by Europeans. Uh, and so uh, Li Shengwu, who was uh, who eventually ends up in the very, very end of Wang Jingwei's administration, serves as his uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. He actually, uh, at the begin at the end of the 20s, he was in Oxford uh, trying to study with James Brierley and uh, reading Thomas Hardy novels. 
And uh, 10 years later, he is uh, serving as a kind of liaison with uh, between Wang Jingwei and Japan uh, and uh, tells uh, stories about how in the interim he had visited Vietnam and saw uh, local uh, people being used as literal footstools for French colonial officers climbing into carriages. And those sorts of things just set him off so much that he decided that, you know, it would be better to uh, up to adopt uh, a pro-Japanese policy. Uh, in terms of this international law sphere specifically, I think actually uh, the influence does decline, though, by the 30s, especially, uh, and really uh, more or less by the 20s, because the Japanese expertise in international law was formed during this uh, pre-Versailles era, before the League of Nations existed, and really reflected these kind of traditional doctrines of Blunchley and those sorts of continental jurists. And into the post-Versailles period, there's a lot of innovation happening, and almost all of it is happening in French, and it's happening in the West and among Western diplomats uh, and, and lawyers. So uh, by that point already, the Japanese international lawyers, although they're, they're involved in all of these processes, very much so, but they're more clearly in a kind of subsidiary role with regards to any of the new innovations that are coming along. And so for um, the Chinese uh, international lawyers, it becomes even more clear that if they want to stay abreast of the latest developments, they need to be you know, really uh, learning English and French and spending either a lot of time with policymakers in Washington or uh, in being there in Geneva in these rooms where the international law elites are coming up with their proposals. So I see uh, another question from Raymond on uh, will China's recently expressed worldview impact the development of, of international law, which traditionally is developed by non-Asian sovereign powers? Uh, so is recently expressed worldview. Um, so by that, I, I take it you would be referring to kind of uh, the very recent years, Xi Jinping kind of thought on uh, international issues. Uh, and things like the community of shared future for mankind uh, or human community of fate, which is the way that I like to translate it based on the etymology, but, um, uh, and these other sort of global initiatives and things like that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that the impact that the United States stands to have is probably quite, uh, uh, the impact that the China stands to have under Xi is probably large. However, uh, I think uh, an aspect of it that is missed uh, and that is relevant to the narrative in the book is actually that it, in a lot of ways, is quite conservative. So she, uh, in terms of, you know, not to, not him personally, but in terms of uh, his administration over the last 10 years and going into the third term, uh, in terms of these international law and international organizational initiatives, a, a lot of them are either status quo oriented and they're just rejecting more innovative doctrines such as uh, human rights based responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention uh, or wide ranging sanctions powers to be used on the basis of international law enforcement by particular states. Uh, these sorts of things. So in a sense, they're often quite conservative, again, not just to international law of 1945, but even to the international law of, you know, 1880 or 1890 uh, on, on some aspects, uh, but not, not with regards to the use of force or some of these other things that are covered in the UN Charter itself. Uh, so they, on the one side, there's a lot of conservatism there rather than radical innovation. Uh, and on the other side, there is uh, a, uh, I would argue at least, uh, conservatism and also uh, what, you, what you could call mimesis or uh, emulation of the United States. So to the extent that there is uh, innovation that's happening, uh, 
from the Chinese side, a lot of it is kind of clearly modeled on U.S. examples. So the Belt and Road Initiative comes closest to the U.S. kind of, you know, international loan uh, infrastructure that was created um, via the IMF and World Bank and also the Marshall Plan. Uh, and even with things like the these very recent um, push for a global security initiative, uh, you could argue that this is closely related to U.S. security-oriented initiatives uh, from the 1990s and uh, War on Terror, uh, though adopting Beijing's own priorities, which are very much more statist and more based on uh, consensus uh, in international institutions. And then you especially see that in the trade realm. Uh, so with you know China now being the grand sort of main defender of the WTO system in the face of very sharp disagreement and disillusionment from the United States, but also from other Western states uh, who are increasingly more skeptical about this inherited infrastructure of world trade, whereas China, which has benefited so much from the existing system, uh, is really more or less happy to see it stay in place for the most part. So in that sense, uh, I think that the influence that is likely to be exerted by China under Xi is... Uh, you know, it is it is significant, but uh, I think it'll be a complicated topic because in many respects, it will be a kind of, you know, raising the barricades to defend some of the existing architecture against uh, the it's the former creators of that architecture that now actually want to tear it down. Uh, and uh, in other respects, I think that there will be more innovative initiatives, um, but I would actually expect, uh, and this is really more purely speculative, but I would expect maybe we could see more of that at the regional level, um, such as via China ASEAN interactions, uh, but less so within the UN system. And hey, Ryan, I actually want to follow up on Raymond's question about uh, the connection between sort of your study of China's history and, and interacting with international law and its current stance on some of the issues that you just mentioned, because you say that some of your current work is also focused on uh, seeing these current issues through a lens of, of history. As you mentioned, uh, I definitely agree that in some areas of international law, especially in trade issues, China seems to be largely following and uh, advocating for a new liberal approach to trade rather than, say, deglobalization, which is what the U.S. has been uh, pushing in, uh, during Trump, Trump's administration. And in other areas, and in the development of right to development or, and the combination, say, of, of um, uh, sovereign loan and hard infrastructure and China's efforts to engage on, on uh, Belt and Road countries in Africa and Latin America on, 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 on these issues, are probably also based on China's experience of interacting with Japan when Japan was heavily involved in uh, development cooperation with China back in the in 80s and early 90s. There are also areas in which China seems to be more uh, and willing to engage uh, more actively in international negotiation, and most evidently in the area of, of environmental uh, regulation and, and climate change. So I wonder uh, if I can sort of push this question a bit further. And um, based on your research about China's and, and the history, and the recent history, which is uh, traditionally known or, or conceived as a century of humiliation in China when China was engaging and forced, um, forced by and the Western powers to engage in the international system. And you mentioned that one of the takeaways for your research is the objectification of China in the modern international legal system. So I wonder to what extent do you see China's position or attitude towards international law has changed or has not changed in the past 20 years? Yeah, so the, the, the idea of the, the century of humiliation is so foundational to the Communist Party's legitimacy narrative that, uh, you know, I think that it's probably not going to be dislodged anytime soon. Uh, and it, it's real. I mean, it's written into uh, 
even the, the preamble to the Constitution, more or less, uh, and as well as other kind of very significant texts. Uh, and it's, to a large extent, it's not an incorrect narrative, uh, although the concept of Guachir, uh is, uh, you know, it's obviously, it's it's not a very technical uh, and specific concept. It's really, it's, it's emotional, right? So uh, if you were try to try and really analyze it uh, on a really purely logical level, there's really, you know, all you're left with is this sense that the state should be treated as a greater power than it is being treated. Uh, so, you know, that aspect of things, uh, I think is probably there to stay for a very long time that when people look back at this history, that, that, that will be kind of the main thing that is perceived or the first thing at least. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that we do see some shifts, uh, which are quite interesting. So particularly over the past uh, year, I guess, or a couple years, there's been this shift in the way of talking about uh, the isolationist policies of the Ming and Qing uh, and the idea that, uh, you know, not accepting foreign trade or closing the borders was not this sort of failed self-defeating, not purely this sort of failed and self-defeating policy but actually was potentially uh, tactically uh, desirable in some ways. So there was uh, a couple uh, official, a couple academics have written works advocating this point of view, uh, including, um, uh, including some who have risen to high levels, such as the current head of uh, CASS and uh, the this sort of an argument uh i think actually you know i don't find it necessarily to be purely politically motivated or propagandistic um because i think there is to a certain extent to which the previous understanding which was largely derived from the western scholarship which was that it was this kind of unforgivable sin for the Qing dynasty not to throw open the doors to international trade and diplomacy as soon as it possibly could. Uh, you know, I think that that uh, was not necessarily the the best, uh, the approach that would have been in the national interest. So if the Qing dynasty had been more cooperative and collaborative without the opium wars, if it had just accepted, you know, Western uh, economic and military diplomatic legal penetration more so then it would have avoided some of the conflicts that arose, but it very, very likely would have led to other conflicts. And there would have been other types of, uh, power that were being exerted and potentially even, you know, active policies of, uh, divide and rule like those that were undertaken in India. Um, so it's very hard to say that, uh, the the kind of Bainian Gorcher narrative is fully uh, incorrect, but also that it's probably oversimplified because as we see already by the late Qing period, there were these officials that were quite savvy and quite aware of the predicament of the state. They were really interested in trying to improve uh, China's international status and its agency uh, and initiative. And they were trying to do so using very limited tools that they had available uh, and with more or less an awareness that they were representing a state that was very vulnerable and very weak. Um, so uh, I think once you account for all of that, and if you downplay the ideology element of things where nationalism per se is seen as an essential ingredient for overcoming Guochir, right, uh, that kind of power politics and then international statecraft are their own categories and national identity and national like emotional unity is its own whole separate other thing. Uh, I think if you start deconstructing this idea of the national shame narrative a little bit, you start getting something that's a little bit more uh, rational and, and perhaps analytically useful. 
Uh, and is that happening now under Xi? Uh, I don't think so. I, I mean, there's been this big embrace of nationalism uh, and the, you know, Zhonghua Minzu Wei Da Fuxing. But uh, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily that also that the nationalist narrative today is stronger than it was in the 90s per se. Uh, it seems to be more or less consistent. It's just perhaps being articulated more effectively uh, as China becomes more powerful. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, with the implications for the international system, again, I think actually it's, what interests me with uh, with the current developments is the element of conservatism and status quo. So uh, I expect that to continue even as there are probably some additional new innovative initiatives kind of at the margins. Thank you. And I think a follow-up question from Raymond is also relevant to our discussion just now. So Raymond asked uh, whether you think um, Xi's views sound more ideology-free, whereas the U.S. Um, was more sort of pushing for a wider extension of Western-style de democracy. It seems that, um, and, and do you think that China's sort of worldview, recent worldview, or current engagements with international legal system is more driven by this uh, sort of its desire to attract or to strengthen its legitimacy within its own domestic constituents rather than, say, speaking to an international audience? Do you think that's uh, uh, what you're uh, uh, trying to implicate? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that's overall accurate. Um, partially, it's accurate because the just this, the distinction here is being drawn with the United States, which is very exceptional in, in the way that it promotes democracy uh, and liberal norms. So, if the exception was uh, or the distinction was being drawn with, um, you know, some European states uh, or you know, indeed neighbors such as South Korea or Japan, uh, I think that the distinction would be a little bit uh, harder to draw in terms of being ideology free. So that Beijing is not ideology free, of course, uh, it's, ide it's very, very ideology uh, packed. Uh, and uh, potentially, in some cases, on some policies, ideology determined, but not necessarily on all policies. Um, but, you know, and, th and I think that includes in terms of foreign relations and in international law settings uh, that uh, Beijing has ideological preferences, uh, even when it doesn't state them explicitly. So with regards to the Belt and Road, you know, we see there's uh, theoretically and in terms of the rhetoric that's used, there's a total neutrality in terms of what sorts of uh, states or what types of uh, regime types Beijing is partnering with, with these arrangements. But in practice, many of the financing arrangements uh, and infrastructure projects are part of these kind of uh, inter-elite relationships where small kind of uh, either... Uh, and, you know, the term that's used in the United States now is auto aut autocracy, but uh, I think that's a very bad and not particularly useful term for a lot of reasons uh, because it just covers so much territory. But generally, we see things such as oligarchies or places with small ruling elites uh, uh, or one party states or de facto one party states uh, or indeed full on autocratic dictatorships uh, or indeed monarchies. Uh, that are kind of seemingly the preferred partners for Beijing with a lot of these deals. Uh, and it seems like that a lot of that is because of Beijing's own preferences for policy stability and stability of uh, diplomacy and even of the financial arrangements. And also um, that it's easier to have a quid pro quo favor extracting type relationship with somebody who's going to be in office 20 years from now or whose son or other relative or you know, fellow uh, junta member will be in power 20 years from now, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, a place like Germany where you have to deal with power politics, uh, party politics, and uh, a lot of public discourse, and 
a potentially, you know, totally changed domestic political uh, situation uh, that you're not really in control over. So I think China does seem to prefer uh, on an ideological basis, dealing with states that have stable political regimes, uh, not Marxist or communist, but stable. Uh, and so that, uh, in a sense, uh, seems to also, uh, also serve as a kind of general factor that's influencing uh, that some of the current diplomacy and, and even international law initiatives. So we see this with regards to Europe in particular, right? Like Beijing is very close to these uh, Eastern uh, European and Balkan kind of uh, more autocratic leaning states uh, and those with, uh, with uh, figures like Orban who are kind of reliably going to be in power, who are alienated from Brussels, who have their own development agendas that are kind of align with that of Beijing. Uh, and it's it has a lot more trouble with um, Northern and Western European states. So yeah, I think I think we sh we should see Beijing as ideological, not as ideological as either it has been in the past or as uh, the United States has been often. Thank you. Those things we've already exceeded the time limit and we still have one final question from the uh, audience so i just quickly uh, summarize the question here and then the recent years uh, there are uh, some terms uh, raised by chinese scholars like professor wang yijo about this creative involvement or constructive involvement that seem to have um, implied the change in china's definition or china's uh, interpretation of uh, international legal terms such as sovereignty so, and, 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 and Ryan, I wonder, to what extent do you think such uh, sort of reinterpretation or reconfiguration of existing terms of international law may change the future rulemaking um, in the international legal system? Yeah, uh, so I think that's, a, that's another great question. Um, yes, so, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it is a reality that, uh, you know, almost whenever, anyone, even an individual, but especially a, a state, whenever they claim to inter interpret and apply a norm, uh, they're usually also adding something to it or in some way reinterpreting it or applying it in a, in some kind of new way or adding a dimension to it. So it's, re it's really very hard to just purely repeat what has gone before. So even when you're not trying to, as a state uh, acting on the international sphere, you're usually innovating to some extent. Uh, with that said, you know, I think that uh, we should probably hope that China and other states are not too willing to creatively uh, involve themselves in or constructively reimagine sovereignty. Because when people do creatively reimagine things, they're usually doing so in large part in terms of their own self-interest. So uh, I think actually it's very much kind of in in the interests of a lot of other states, especially China's neighbors uh, and many of its trade partners, that this more conservative status quo oriented interpretation of sovereignty does last longer rather than that we start to see exceptions being drawn here and there, uh, which actually do already exist, of course. You know, we see this with regards to um, some of the outwardly focused United Front type stuff, although it's it's really exaggerated in terms of a lot of the Western media coverage, but you know it does exist, uh, as well as um, sanctions targeting specific organizations like think tanks that are too critical, etc. Uh, so anyway, uh, of course, Beijing is not really purely absolutist with its interpretation of sovereignty, even if it is more strict and more traditional in the way that it in interprets it than most Western states are today. Um, but if it were to get, you know, let's just imagine 20 years down the line, if it were to be, you know, really willing to say, well, sovereignty is just a social construct and it's whatever states make of it uh, and be really, you know, adopt a full constructivist IR kind of view of the world, uh, then I think it would actually probably be pretty, um, 
pernicious or at least uh, risky for states like uh, Laos, Cambodia, you know, Central Asian states, uh, and also various trade partners. Not in the sense of traditional imperialism, of course, but just in terms of the exertion of all that economic uh, and international weight uh, and power in various ways. Um, so the idea that, uh, you know, based on the current uh, uh, perspectives on sovereignty, things like the arrangement with Sri Lanka for the ownership of the Hambantota port uh, were really not that dangerous at all for the host state because it's just a port uh, that has facilities for docking non-military ships. And uh, although you can sign an agreement that says, you know, if we can't pay back our loan, we're going to give you back the port for 99 years, uh, or you, you get to keep the, the port under your management for 99 years, um, that's a financial uh, arrangement uh, and a trade uh, and logistical arrangement that has very, very little impact on actual human security or on military issues or on any other issues of sovereignty. So under existing international law doctrine, as well as the doctrine of uh, that's been accepted by China itself domestically and also by Sri Lanka and by many other states, uh, you know, if there were any actual security concern over that arrangement, then the state would be fully justified in ending it immediately. And the entire global community would support them in doing so. You know, if, if China were to sail a gunboat in and start making demands or something like that. Uh, so th that that is the status quo as we stand today. Uh, and that's kind of the sort of positive side of sovereignty, that it does tell us that there is this line beyond which forms of influence and coercion uh, cannot uh, go or should not go. Uh, Beijing so far has been happy to be very, very supportive of that idea. And that's in part based on the history that's covered uh, or dealt with in the book. And uh, in part also based on other kind of more practical considerations, including its desire not to have the US in particular exerting too much influence. So sovereignty serves as a little bit of a bulwark against that. But uh, yeah, going forward, uh, you know, I don't think we should assume that uh, the future is entirely determined by what's happened in the past. So Beijing could become less committed to a strict interpretation of sovereignty, though maybe we should hope that it doesn't. Wonderful. So I think that's the perfect ending to our today's uh, talk. I'd like to thank Ryan again for sharing your fascinating work with us and do keep us posted about your current research on the connections between these ongoing important issues concerning China and international legal order. I also want to thank Phoenix and others at CCPL for putting this event together. And finally, to all our participants today for raising these great questions and taking time to participate in this discussion. Bye-bye for now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.